COPD is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which is a progressive obstruction of the airways, usually in this country due to cigarette smoking, although COPD can occur in non-smokers, particularly in developing countries where wood smoke is an important risk factor. But this is a very common disease and it's affecting more than 20% of smokers. Um, it's probably found in about 10% of the population over the age of 40. Uh, it's equally prevalent in men and women now, and it's the third commonest cause of death in this country, as well as being a leading cause of hospital admission. So it's a very important disease because of its high prevalence and the high morbidity that it has. Well, COPD is a disease mainly affecting elderly people and there's increasing evidence to suggest that it's due to acceleration of the normal aging process that occurs in the lung because even normal people lose lung function over time. Uh, but this is exaggerated in COPD and we're interested in the mechanisms of accelerated aging which is normally protected by several endogenous anti-aging molecules of which the, the best known are sirtuins which are protein deacetylases and what we found some years ago is that sirtuin 1 and sirtuin 6 are markedly reduced in the lungs and cells of COPD patients. There are actually seven sirtuins, the others are completely normal. So it seems to be like a selective reduction of SIRT1 and 6. And the reason that we studied microRNA34A is that it had been known to be an inhibitor of SIRT1. So we decided to look at whether 34A was increased in COPD and whether this was correlated with the reduction in SIRT1. And we found that this was the case, that there's a, a marked increase in 34A. Uh, it's correlated with reduced SIRT1 and SIRT6. And then we looked at how this might come about and showed that oxidative stress which reduces SIRT1 and SIRT6 is able to increase microRNA 34A in cells. So we then looked at how this affected the aging process by measuring markers of cellular senescence. So one thing that has been known is that in COPD there's an increase in senescent cells in the lung and you can see various markers of cellular senescence are increased. And what we found is that there's a big increase in senescent cells in COPD of, of any cell that we look at. It shows senescence. And that this is associated with reduced SIRT1 and increased 34A. And if we um, use a, a mimic of 34A uh, to put into cells like epithelial cells, we can show that this reduces SIRT1 in these cells and also increases the markers of cellular senescence. So we then uh, looked at an antagomere, which is a sequence complementary to microRNA 34A in order to block its effect and we showed that the reduced SIRT1 that we see after oxidative stress in normal epithelial cells can be restored by blocking 34A with this antagomere. And the antagomere not only increased SIRT1 and SIRT6, but it also reduced the markers of cellular senescence, which was quite a surprise to us. Well, we were very surprised because we'd always thought that cellular senescence was a permanent state that the cells went into. It's basically cell cycle arrest, which is a sort of protective mechanism that's evolved to reduce the risk of cancers and DNA mutations uh, before people reproduce. So it, it's it's always been known as cellular senescence as being linked to the aging process uh, and we always envisage this to be a permanent change in the cell but what we showed is that if you 
inhibit 34A, as I just mentioned, we actually can reverse the markers of cellular senescence. And this is not just uh, biochemical markers. So if we take epithelial cells from COPD patients that have cellular senescence, we know that these cells grow very poorly in culture compared with cells from non-COPD controls of the same age. And this slowing of cell division is a feature of aging and cellular senescence. And what we're able to do is by blocking 34A, we can actually improve the growth of these cells. It, they don't go back completely to normal, but they go towards normal, which we've described as rejuvenation of the cells. Well, we think this is very important because COPD is associated with many other diseases which we call comorbidities. 95% uh, of COPD patients have at least one comorbidity. So this is very common, but many patients have multiple morbidities, seven or more other diseases. And many of these diseases are also diseases of accelerated aging that involve exactly the same pathways and reduction of sirtuin 1, for example. Um, so common comorbidities include cardiovascular diseases and type 2 diabetes, where you see exactly the same pathways and an increase in 34A. So this is the same mechanism. And probably these diseases are occurring in parallel, which is why it's probably more accurate to describe them as multimorbidity, although often one disease predominates. So if lung disease predominates, the patient goes to see a chest physician. If type 2 diabetes predominates, they go and see an endocrinologist. But these diseases, other diseases, are also there. And if they follow the same mechanisms, then it follows that you might be able to develop interventions that treat all of these diseases in parallel. So in other words, treat the multimorbidity rather than the specific organ-related disease. Well, as I described in our studies in vitro, we, we use an antagomere of 34A to block its effects. Um, this is a, a short sequence uh, of RNA, so could potentially be a therapy. I mean, the big challenge is to get this into cells and the right cells in the lung. So we know that microRNAs are now being used as therapeutic, so you can get them into cells, and the same would apply to the antagomeres. Um, but it's quite inefficient, the delivery at the moment, so it may be necessary to improve delivery methods. Um, people have expressed some concerns that this may be having widespread effects because microRNA is regulating uh, several pathways. But one way to look at this in the future is to deliver the microRNA antagomere by inhalation to get around some of the potential systemic effects that you might see with this sort of drug. And I think that's a, a route of delivery that's currently being explored by various pharmaceutical companies because there are several microRNAs of interest that could be of therapeutic value, you know, therapeutic targets. So I think this is something that will develop quite rapidly. But what we've shown is that there are other drugs that could affect microRNA. So antioxidants, since this is driven by oxidative stress, would be one possibility. And the pathway that leads to increased microRNA involves PI3 kinase activation and mTOR activation. And these pathways can be inhibited by existing drugs like rapamycin and metformin, which are used for other purposes. So that it may be that we can use existing drugs to impact this mechanism.
Well, it, it's a very long time um, for drug discovery because of the regulatory hurdles and the expense. And it's even more difficult for diseases like asthma and COPD because these are not immediately lethal like cancer and some immune diseases where you can get a fast track for drug development. But in fact COPD is a very serious disease when it's severe and has a high mortality. So you could argue that they should accelerate development of drugs for patients with the most severe disease. But it, it, it is taking far too long to develop drugs. And new drugs for pulmonary diseases are very few and far between. It has, the respiratory field has the worst track record of any major disease areas in terms of new drug development. And I think that's a reflection of the poor investment by pharmaceutical companies in respiratory medicine in contrast to the huge investment in cancer, Alzheimer's, cardiovascular disease, where new drugs have been produced. Well, I think w what we need is more effective treatments for COPD and also for severe asthma and pulmonary fibrosis. So current treatments are not adequate for these diseases and I think that means understanding the disease mechanisms better. But we recognise in all these diseases that there may be phenotypes that would respond better to one type of treatment than another. So this is already happening in asthma where there are new drugs now approved for eosinophilic inflammation that is a mechanism of some severe asthma patients. So it's possible to select people that would respond well to these treatments because they have persisting eosinophils despite steroid therapy. And the hope is that similar approaches will apply to these other diseases like COPD and pulmonary fibrosis that you'll recognize people that will benefit from more specific treatments and also the patients that would have less side effects from specific treatments and that's where biomarkers that you mentioned before become very important because the biomarkers could be developed to select which people will respond. So going back to 34A it could be a very useful biomarker of accelerated aging to select the people who might profit most from intervening in that pathway. Well, I, I think that people need to do science in order to recognize that they like to do it because I was very reluctant to go into research but it was some requirement of getting a consultant post at the time I was training and then I enjoyed research so people need to try it. I wouldn't recommend respiratory research because there's no funding uh, either from pharmaceutical companies or from the government or charities is very very poorly funded. It has the biggest discrepancy between funding and disease burden of any disease area that exists. So I would recommend people to go and work in cancer or cardiovascular disease or neuroscience where there's a lot more funding.